Demons Discuss, take two. The one with all the vampires. Welcome to Demons Discuss Take Two, an unofficial podcast about the All Souls universe and the various topics that orbit it. We are your hosts, Angela, Jean, and Valerie, and we'll begin at the end as usual. I'm Valerie, and let me introduce you to Angela and Jean. Hi, Angela. Hello. And hi, Jean. Hello. And we don't have much for news this time, so we're just going to go straight to Jean, and she's going to lead us into our discussion. Hi, welcome to The One with the Vampires. Today, we're going to talk about vampires in their various guises beyond the All Souls universe. Vampires from the old school Eastern European mythology to Vlad the Impaler, who shows up in the All Souls universe. The vampire created on a on the same weekend as the Frankenstein story with the Shelleys and Lord Byron. Then the one we're all familiar with, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Dracula. Yay. <laughs> and then we'll move on to more modern vampires like Anne, Va- Anne Rice's Vampire Lestat, Edward and Bella from True Light, and Suki Stackhouse and her crew in True Blood. If we're lucky, we may even have some time to talk about Buffy, Spike, and Angel. And then we'll talk <laughs> about how this all ties into the All Souls universe. That's and the plan, huh? <laughs> that's the plan. It's an ambitious plan. And I'm going to throw in the fact that our fearless leader used to have a stand-up of Spike in her office. Really? Yeah, I Deb didn't know can, that. Deb confessed to either. that a long time ago. <laughs> like a like a like a cardboard a, stand-up a, of Spike. Oh, well, that's that's serious fan girl. Yeah, learn something new. I know. I would have expected Angel, but she's All a Spike right. girl. Look out! So we're starting with Eastern European and folklore and the word origins. Yeah, word origins. All right. So the word where, it's interesting. It has wolfish um, beginnings. So we can't get to vampire unless we first cross the wolf. So where comes from Old Norse, meaning outlaw or wolf, and in the Swedish Swedish variation also means wolf, um, which is interesting because there's a lot of wolf-vampire similarities um, with social behavior, their anatomy, um, their heightened sensory abilities, hunting behavior, packs, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a long history, and I think origins um, of where is wolf, and then as we see... Um, so like Sh- the werewolf. Werewolf, exactly, exactly. Okay. And as we see that timeline, um, because we don't really have the, the modern concept of vampire until really, you know, Victorian or Romanticism until then, um, so... Look at Shadow of Night. Uh, there is Peter Stube, who is sp- supposedly a werewolf, where he eats his victims, you know, drinks their blood. Um, but that is probably the origins of a vampire. And although you know, there's vampires in the All Souls world, um, people don't know what to call them. Uh, humans don't know what to call them, so they start, you know, with with werewolf and were. So that is the beginnings of vampire. That's what they call. Well, yeah, and that's what they call them in Shadow of Night, though. Where and uh, the Jennifer Akita kept using that that sound at the end. Do you know what I'm right. talking about? Yes, yeah. yes. I was going to say I, when when Fetch when when Goody Alsop uh, calls uh, Matthew. I know exactly what you are aware. I I could not do it justice like Jennifer Akita, but yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that that I was like, uh, I took German, but I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the romant. Oh, the thing about the romantics is. Um, Really kind of fascinating, and it was another rabbit hole I went down. Uh, there was a gathering at Lake Como, which was very famous. Uh, it was basically a house party with Lord Byron, Percy Bysshe Shelley, his wife Mary Shelley, John Polidori, who is the Dr. Feelgood of his day. And after ingesting a lot of alcohol and probably some drugs, they decided to tell ghost stories. Oh, yeah, well, that's where we got Frankenstein from that weekend. Oh, and, I'm learning all kinds of things. <laughs> Keep <but> going. <laughs> more importantly, that's also where we g- get one of the earliest vampire stories. 
The Vampire, which was written by John Polidori. Uh, he's a precursor to Starker's Dracula and was one of the first popular novels to utilize vampires as a main character. And in many respects, a lot of the characteristics you see in Dracula being an Eastern European count and other, uh, a threat to women, a threat to the status quo started in the Polidori vampire story. And plus, I just love the fact that it came from that weekend. So it was just pretty much a wild party. And they just laid around and said, hey, what if we told ghost stories? And then they all took to their, they well, all went home and well, took, started typing or, well, they didn't type back then. But let's not forget, <laughs> these are the original mad, bad and dangerous to know guys. Yeah. Hello. I mean, that, <laughs> that would be George Gordon, Lord Byron. Yeah. He was a troublemaker. He was a spendthrift. He slept and knocked up his stepsister, I think. He wow. Was a wow. Well, well and got a vampire us, out of that. <laughs> let us not forget, if I'm going on a flight of fancy, that, you know, the pre-Raphaelites and Marcus during that time was probably mad, bad, and dangerous to know at that point, too. Yeah, and let's also not forget that Polidori is... Tied to Dante Rossetti in a way. And if you look at the timing from the time Marcus was turned to when he shows up in New Orleans, he could have very well taken on the guise of John Polidori traveling through Italy and France with Lord Byron. And plus, wouldn't that be something that a baby vampire having a fit would do? Yes. Write a story about a fake vampire. (laughs) Write about what you know. Hey, yeah. that's what they always tell you. It's like, well, use what I got. This is yeah. what I got. Let me write about it. Oh, and then before we even get to Bram Stoker, the quintessential vampire with his Dracula, we had a couple of other uh, popular stories. There was Carmilla, which was the first female vampire. When We have a lot of those in our story. And then there was also a vampire story called the Horla. And the interesting... The- wait, wait, spell it. H O R L A. Okay, the Horla. <laughs> and the best part is, is that the author of that story, the author of that story, has a connection to the real life Lapierre. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, Chateau du Moral. Yes, ma'am. As you know, like I said, useless, useless knowledge. <laughs> As you said that, I was I was reading it, but I could not say that like you, Angela. The French, the French uh, pronunciation of the chateau. <laughs> I was like, oh. I wasn't even going to try. Uh, you know what? I, I took French in high school and I can write it pretty well and I understand it pretty well. Just very basic French. But coming up with a pronunciation, ah, no, I would be that girl in France. I, w- I will attempt <laughs> it, but I'm sure I would not pass the mustard in a foreign country, but. I'll, I'll 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 pass for now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For, I mean, for these purposes, you're golden. <laughs> I mean, the best I can get is tarje, and that's an American <laughs> word. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have Stoker, and um, then oh. we go on. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, here's the big thing: Dra- the Dracula. Everybody knows that's he's a typical vampire. You can't go out in the daylight. Can turn into a bat, drinks blood. I think he set the template for yeah. the typical vampire, what we expect from a vampire, a vampire story. And then the deviations we read, they always have to explain that part away exactly. as far as, as human myth and everything. So I, I do believe Dracula is the template. He, he is a best known template, most certainly. Yeah. yeah. And the thing I love about Dracula is as so many graduate students have tried to take apart the story. <laughs> they, they turn it into an analysis of the other. Dra- Dracula represented the immigrants coming in and having their way with their women and being a threat. And we kind of have some of that going on now. So it's not even. <laughs> well, and what's, what's so interesting about it is, is it's the exact opposite of Deb's vampires. Yeah. Because she tries to almost use them as a unifying force and, and 
talks about the similar similarities of all of us when back in the Victorian era, they were emphasizing all the bad and different things using a vampire as a character. Right. The quote unquote other. Yes. Well, what's interesting is, you know, like you just said, Deb uses vampires in a different way in, in her all souls world, but as the historian Deb, um, looks at vampires and werewolves and all those kind of monsters in a different way. The historian Deb says people try to base something off of um, that's linked in some real way. So they try to explain away what a va- what they think is a vampire. And it kind of goes to Matthew's quote of normal is a bedtime story, a fable that humans tell themselves. So um, what, whatever monster that is in society, whether it's people, you know, Practicing immigrants. witchcraft. Immigrants, exactly. And it's um, not even people to... practicing witchcraft. It's women being smart. Yes, exactly. But per- the per- perception that it's they're yes. doing something they shouldn't be. So we have that. And then we've got all, the very interesting thought with the Victorian Dracula-type vampire is the, the whole blood sucking at the neck. And, and that's how they seduce their prey and pretty much how they... What's the word I'm looking? How can I put this politely? That's about the only way they have interactions with their female prey. Vampires can't have sex. They're the undead. Now we yeah. look at Deb's vampires. They seem to have very full love lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes for the modern ones too. But you know, I'll save that for later. It's yeah. is sex is a now. Nowadays, sex is a prerequisite. Is there going to be vampires? Well, except for in Twilight, but it, we kind of it, like yeah. the Vampire latest sex is a given now. Yes. Yes. And the latest right. uh, novels that have come out, uh, I think the one I can think of is maybe Black Dagger, the Brotherhood. Black Dagger Brotherhood as sex is going to happen. Well, but, that's Deb said that's what got her interested because she saw she was in the airport and she saw bodice ripping, you know, book covers. And she thought, wow, vampires really have uh, an active sex life. So let me see what that's all about. I thought she wanted to know what they did for a living. Well, or, is that, or is that the PG, PG version <laughs> of the story? <laughs> I think she did say that, too, in addition to. Yeah. Yes. She, and she wondered, you know, what would they do? What would they do on a daily basis? What would a Besides vampire do on a daily basis? Besides having a love life. Yes. So. Vampire dating, there's a thought. Do, do, they, <laughs> do they use Tinder? <laughs> <laughs> Matthew's rolling his eyes right now. <laughs> what is this Tinder of which you speak? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We should probably mention that if you haven't, just check out Matthew's page on Facebook. And I'll put that in the show notes. That It's kind of amusing the way Deb does run Matthew on Facebook. So it's kind of amusing the way that she relates Matthew to the rest of modern world yes very much so his yeah. his voice is amusing yeah and he does come off like that stuffy dude <laughs> yes he does it's like what okay um so we have uh Polderi and stoker and then we're getting closer with the Anne rice yeah, well i was gonna say Anne rice is pretty traditional in, in her vampires uh habits and she, life she and death a- yeah. I mean, th- her vampires also, they, you know, can't be affected by crosses and garlic and wooden stakes, not in that traditional template. Um, but they are traditional in feeding and making of vampires. In and there's, th- Yep. And their preternatural senses. And I guess one way that they are traditional is they do sleep in coffins, which Matthew clearly says that they don't. And, they and, do, uh, and Matthew clearly sleeps very rarely, but he does sleep. Yeah, and I think Diana even mentioned that in was it a Discovery Witches was like, oh, they sleep like the dead. That's where that vampire story came from. Where that that's where that human myth came from. came from. Yeah, they when they sleep, it's not that they sleep in coffins, but they sleep like the dead. And one so. one benefit for Anne Rice's vampires are the longer you live, the more, you know more wise you get. You're you might get gifts or special powers. So Matthew or even Baldwin, you know, a very old vampire, um, they ha- they might get special gifts. And Matthew might not be such a sourpuss by having to be 1,500 years old <laughs> and helping around. <laughs> All right. So my impression of Matthew, I think when he was wandering around those 15 years, he had periods of brightness like we saw one in Shadow of Night, mm-hmm. you know. 
And then the rest of the time, I had the impression that he was in complete solitude, just wandering around mm. until he met somebody or some or caught something that caught his fancy. So, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, back to you, Angela. I'm sorry. Anne Rice. No. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, with the possibility that they could get special gifts. I mean, another way that they could become more seasoned or, or gain gifts is through drinking an older vampire's blood. So you would have to wonder, Matthew and Philippe in Anne Rice's world, how wise Matthew would be after um, draining Philippe. So he would absorb Philippe's powers or, or whatever. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, he would become physically stronger, mystically more powerful. I mean, that happens naturally with age, but you can increase it exponentially by draining a, or drinking from an older vampire. Yeah. Wasn't one of the the big fears in the vampire world of Anne Rice was that Lestat had drank from the or, one of the origin vampires? Yes. Akasha. Which is why I went down that rabbit hole with Matthew and Philippe. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, I'm not really familiar with Anne Rice's work, but, you know, of course you see it all the time when you mention vampire stories i saw the movie and i i read the book i think but i I, her writing doesn't appeal to me personally it may appeal to whoever but to me it it didn't appeal to me another i was gonna say one more interesting thing about Anne rice is that her vampire this the her vampires came from the gods or at least what were perceived as egyptian gods right whether that had anything to do with with some of Deb's hints she's dropped on her origin or not, I guess that remains to be seen. Hopefully, we'll find out a little bit more in the Serpent's Mirror. Oh, so like uh, Philippe, the hints that he was the original Hercules, that, you know, he is the legend of Hercules. People base their legend based on him? No, even more so in, in Anne Rice's world, the original vampires were the result of humans drinking the blood of a demon or a god. Oh, okay. Okay. Which would, which would actually tie into the uh, myth of the brightborns that we find out about in the book of life. The brightborns being the uh, witch or the weaver in blood rage vampire myths. Uh, Actually the, yeah, the story that comes about towards the end of the end of the book uh, where they talk about the vampire is even more powerful than Philippe. In Book of Life? Yeah, in Book of Life. Um, oh. God, I'm trying to remember. Again, it's a foreign word I can't pronounce, <laughs> <laughs> which is the story of my life. No. Oh, well, we'll work around it. I know. <laughs> we'll keep you anyway. We always <laughs> do. I will <laughs> find it. It was also the name of the uh, Persian emperor's guard the word which is another interesting interesting uh thing because they were called the immortals it was the cohort of a thousand warriors and you struck down one and there was always another one to take the dead dead warrior's place but anyways like i said more useless knowledge <laughs> are you, but are you talking about the the poem where the the, the book of life pa- the pages turn and then that poem comes about i'm thinking of towards the end where the myth comes up yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Their yeah. father was eternity and their mother was change. Yes, I see it. For when the three become one. Oh, that's when she found the book of life. And it yeah. was, okay, okay, okay. I'm with you. We're on the same page. The wise the, ones. The blood yes. craft with the wise ones. And the brightborn became the children of night. Now I was going to say one more thing about the Anne Rice vampires, about their gifts, that um, it's almost like they're a mix of uh, vampires and a little bit of gifts that witches have. Um, you know, for instance, they have a spell gift, and there's even a cloud gift where you can cloud your victims' minds. Um, but and that might be a good segue for True Blood when we get to it, because that's a little bit in their world, world too. But I'll wait till we get to that. Twilight has a lot of those elements where they rely on elemental magic, like Edward Scott, a thing where he can. Well, it's not necessarily. I'm I'm thinking of the uh, Elemental series with uh, Elizabeth Hunter, mm-hmm. but um, Twilight. I think Edward can read minds, and yes. they had powers, but one of them could control the elements. And I think Bella, after she became a vampire, she could become a shield, like a mind shield. That's right. And one was an empath. Yes. 
Yes. So they did have special powers there with True Blood. No, not True Blood. Twilight. I'm sorry. True Blood was a whole different. Yeah. I was thinking of um, Anne Rice's vampires have a spell gift where they can cloud minds. And that's kind of gla- like glamour in True Blood. Oh, this is true. There's a lot of glamour, though, in uh, vampire stories. Yeah. Yeah. But don't a lot of the True Blood vampires kind of have a bit of the fae in them? Because it seems like there's a lot of intermixing of fae powers and, and vampires they, there. You know, they, cra- they crave the fae blood. Yeah. I don't know that it gives them extra powers. Well, based on the television show anyway, I don't know that it gives them extra powers, but there's something apparently very delicious about it. I, see. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know. I've never sampled, but I hear it. It's almost like a commercial for Fade Blood. <laughs> Dis- disclaimer to our listeners, we are not drinking. We're not drinking. <laughs> Honest it's to God. Just, it's still daylight. We're trying to be productive. Um, <laughs> um, True Blood as a series. Now the Sookie Stackhouse books, I have not read those, but I watched True Blood as a series. And with those vampires, they fall under the, the same template as Dracula mostly, but they're able to live amongst humans and not drink their blood because someone was able to manufacture this stuff called True Blood. And that's their whole premise. I it's see. Like, true blood is the the is it's think of it as an energy drink for vampires. They serve it at regular bars. You go up and you ask for true blood and the vampire drinks it and he no longer has to drink the the human's blood. Right. And this is how they integrate into society. The whole crux though is what if something happens to the supply, the production, something gets the of blo- true blood. Yes. Yeah. spiked. So that's that's their worst fear. Other, other than that, or, or silver is their other worst fear. Yes. Silver, yes. Which that, is a werewolf thing, actually. Yes. And um, I think at the end of the television series, I have to preface it, it's the television series, I don't know what really happened in the Sookie Stackhouse books, but in the series, in the end, that's exactly what happened. Someone had gotten a hold of the the one soul one soul source of true blood and took it over and they were going to spike it so some vampires had superpowers and became daywalkers or i don't know i it was a couple of years ago and it, that series just kind of fizzled out for me because i was like oh where are they going and from what i hear the books had kind of had a similar ending and to the point where the author was getting death threats at home misery style it was terrible <laughs> 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 it's kind of bad. I, I think that's hard as an author, modern day anyway. You put yourself out there and there's social media and all kinds of ways to attack someone's story. Sure. Yeah, that's what happened to that author there. But Twilight, different. It didn't, the movies didn't differ so much from the books. They cut out a lot in the movies, of course, like they always do. But, um, the first one was all over the place, but the last one stayed pretty true to it. And the twinkly vampire, I don't know. I, I think the author was trying to make this a young adult friendly type of story. And she did. There wasn't any sex. I mean, but towards the end, you know, I'm sure adults were like, well, what about the sex? And it, it actually did come and it wound up having Bella pregnant. And I mean, that people, was a, it was a YA story. That's yeah, yeah. it was. That was very genre, true to genre. It People can a- say what they want about Twilight, but I mean, see, I didn't read the books, but I did see the movies. But I hadn't picked up or been interested in vampires since Anne Rice and Interview with a Vampire. So for whatever it's worth, it got people reading, it got people talking about it, it got people interested in the genre again. Definitely. I wouldn't have found a discovery of witches without Twilight. No, not at all. And that brings us to the discovery witches and the vampires that populate that story. I mean, honestly, Deb's vampires are pretty unique. I mean, she made them all daywalkers. They actually can eat and drink. They mostly drink, though, since most of what they eat doesn't taste very good. They can that's die. The, that's the explanation. Yes, they can die, but they live long lives. Yeah, they're not, immo- they're not immortal. Did she touch upon at all, do they die of natural causes? I've not heard of that. No, the but series. they can be killed. They can be killed. And it seems violently. 
<laughs> well, and the other interesting thing was is that becoming a vampire doesn't fix them, right? You know, heal their heal their wounds or make them younger or anything like that. No, it keeps them in this state. It makes them stronger, taller. From what I was understanding um, from yes. Isabeau's saying, it makes them stronger, taller. It refines their features. But I mean, if you're an old lady, when you like in yeah, the case of Mart, you're still if an you're old. Lady. old you're still an old lady, but you probably look fabulous. <laughs> no, and to me, it seems to me that dead humanized vampires, really, in a lot of I ways. I would say so. I yeah, would say yeah. so. Because um, humans, from my impression in reading the books, humans don't really pick up on them. No, just that they all are really attractive. They, right. they know they're different somehow, but they don't want to address differences. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So much. And I like that. I like that she brought up the all the, you know, um, stereotypes of vampires and ticked them off the list. Like, that's what humans think. And I thought that was really interesting and clever. Oh, it, it was great. And it was a checklist. Yes. Yeah, I think, oh, what was it Matthew who who listed off the things to Diana when, oh, is it at breakfast? Was it at breakfast? No, maybe it was, it was dinner. A, it was one of the dinner. dinners because he was like, yeah. no. Nope. 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 Don't do that either. Nope. That's nope. a human thing. Yep. I don't care about garlic and, and this doesn't affect me. I don't, you know, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't be exact. But yeah, he pretty much debunked every myth that was out there, except he did say, you know, we we do have extra pre, you know, we have preternatural senses. We can hear very well. We can. And blood nourishes us. Yeah, and blood, they do drink blood, and that's how they get their nourishment. Um, I thought it was interesting that they hunted deer, and there's another similarity between that and Twilight. Twilight, uh, Edward, and the Cullens were quote-unquote vegetarian vampires because they only fed on animal blood. Meanwhile, while other vampires fed on humans, um, mm-hmm. they were they were considered the vegetarians. Um, I found it interesting that how crunchy granola. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say it's a, it's a little bit too pure for my liking. I like that Matthew once in a while had to have a human. Yeah, yeah. it's like uh, just a taste, man. Just a taste. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I got a craving for steak. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have a steak. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I live most of my week without the steak, but on Saturday I'm gonna have a steak. <laughs> um. And he did, they did touch upon that when they were explaining, when we were going through that flashback with Marcus saying, you know, he showed Marcus how to feed without killing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was interesting. Um, It was an interesting connection as far as how they feed and how civilized vampires decide to feed. Yes. And what was also interesting is Deb's vampires could get intoxicated from human blood. Yes. Alcohol and drugs would would have an effect on vampires, whereas I don't think you see that in any of the other mythologies. So a vampire would go out and say, "I want to get high," and you know, well, load up a load up a human or a demon, well, and and say, "Okay." Well, <laughs> yeah, like the, the carousing with Kit in yeah. Shadow of Night. Yeah, yeah, and I, I thought that was interesting. It's like you'd almost have to have a uh, somebody who's willing to do that for you, like he did with Kit. Well, right? or he just. They just hunted amongst the attics, you know, go to the local crack house and get yourself, get yourself a a boost. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Every town has one. (laughs) Get yourself a boost. You're like, oh, but yeah, I would imagine that would be frustrating. It's like, man, you know how humans are. We like, it's like you have a goal when you go out sometimes. I want to go out and get drunk. But as a vampire, you'd be like, man, I got to take a friend who's willing to let me bite him. Eh, I don't think so necessarily. It's like <laughs> I, need to, I need to go hang out someplace where there's a bunch of people who are getting in even bigger trouble than I am. Yeah. And I'll hook myself up that way. And hang out with the troublemakers, which isn't necessarily a good thing either. Yeah. It's true. Because I think actually Louisa was feeding off a kit more than Matthew yeah. was. That's true. She never did mention if she fed off a he, oh, that's right. He didn't feed off of Kit. No, because, he didn't. Because, yeah, they mentioned that in that scene. It's like, you know, he would never take your blood, but I will, you know, or something like that. Louisa said something like that. I think it's time for a reread for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a while. 
it's been a long time. Well, I'm like, guess uh, what? Reread's coming up. Yeah, Sorry. it's read along season. That's good. Not that I had a, a, a hard time at all, you know, comprehending the vampires in the All Souls world, but it really helped the parallel um, running of Matthew studying wolves. You know, that intrigued me. And, and just the similarities between vampires and wolves Wolves helped a lot. You know, they run in packs and the Claremont is a pack versus other vampire families, um, what they ate, their Elf, senses, all that alpha kind of stuff. Alpha status, alpha beta, exactly. omega status helped a lot. Easy comparison. It just, I, I when when sh- we thought about the packs of wolves and stuff, I, I just thought about it. I'm like, I wonder how other packs run. I mean, I know how the de Claremonts run their their home and there's basic understood societal rules among vampires. But I always wonder down the street, how did Gerber <laughs> right. run his house? You know, yeah, Gerber's household seemed a lot different than Philippe's. Yeah, so uh, it makes me wonder what kind of familial rules they had in place. Or Domenico, for that matter. The McKellie yeah. household did not look like a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> no. Or maybe it was, depending on who you are. <laughs> Could have been oh, too no. much fun. Could have been too much fun. Uh, something to mark down for a future episode. How did how did Domenico know Louisa? I don't know. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. There's that, our, I mean, yeah, there's my speculation right there. That's a can of worms, and I, I'd like to know that. But, you know, maybe she's writing it, maybe she's not, but... We can still talk yeah. about it. We can still talk about it. Well, you know, I don't like to speculate too much, because if she ever does write about it, I'll be like, that's not what I pictured. <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah, I, that's what I said in the last episode. I, I enjoy watching you guys speculate. It's pretty fun. And honestly, we were wrong on so many things, but I oh, yeah. I took it well. You did. You did. I, I took a few things kind of weird. I was like, wait a minute. She didn't touch this story. And I, I understood she had to wrap it up and everything. But I don't think that series could have hurt with a fourth book. It, it would have been. Well, maybe we'll get real. some answers in the, the Serpent's Mirror. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. I Hopefully think Doug hears our wishes. Yeah. Are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. But anyway, what do you guys think about this whole this whole thing? I really think that it gives, gives us some unique vampires in the world of vampires. And they're a lot more interesting than many of them, really and truly, because they're more like us. Yeah. They're better sexier versions of humans. I love that they were families and I loved to hear their, not their entire backstory, but you know, Baldwin was made in Roman times and Matthew was made around Clovis and the turn of Christianity. I mean, I thought that was really interesting. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's almost like Philippe collected certain people and brought them into his family at certain pivotal times. What? Domenico was a doge. Right. I think it, um, I think that backstory of Philippe choosing his vampires and choosing his his children really explains how they knew so many influential people, right? Mm-hmm. In their in their times. So I, I know when we read Shadow of Night, we're looking. Well, how does he know all these people? But wow. I, I think he specifically when they chose to make their families. Philippe was in the midst of everything, as we know. So, of course, his kids are going to know all these influential people like popes and uh, the Cardinal Joyeuse. And right. Did I say that right? <laughs> Good <laughs> Close enough. enough. Yes. <laughs> Close enough for, for sure. yeah. I know who you meant. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Know who I meant. But, yeah, I think that's that's good. Uh, well, and if you have time on your side, which clearly they do, why wouldn't you know those people? You'd make yourself know those people. Yeah. And considering yes. the fact that you're probably wealthier than the Vatican. People, yes, you become the influencer, the yeah. mover and the shaker, and people come to you. The hand on the sword. But that's this, this also a story for another day, Philippe and his sphere of influence. To touch upon it, that's, I feel like that's why Deb's vampires were so influential. That's why they work. Well. Yeah. And, and she's a historian, and that's yeah. what I adore. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I would say almost the best thing about the de Claremont vampires is, like I said, they're probably the most human. Deb's vampires are very human. Well, I think Chris said that. You guys are all humans. We just have differences in the book of life. I totally agree. I mean, the vampires in the All Souls world, they are multifaceted, 
many layers. They have jobs in the real world. They have many identities that they live. Um, you know, they they dive um, either by staging or they take on you know different roles. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's one of the most interesting is they're really multifaceted and there's so many layers to them. And they fit it within a family of in a cast of characters. They live amongst humans, even if they're living apart from their family. They, they are never so totally apart. It's not the, it's not the count hiding on the mountaintop like Dracula. They're yes, they, in they're the pretty world. close knit. Yeah, um, I think a good example of that was like a gallo glass when he's traveling the world, and he calls Varin or Varin, Varin. Varin. He calls Varen and didn't even know that she was married. <laughs> right. He said, Who, who's that guy? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, we've been apart for a few years, but, you know, they remain close because a few, I mean, what, what was that, mm-hmm. 30, 40 years? It, you know, it, that's not a lot of time for these guys. So, no. hey, that's like me calling Eugene saying, hey, I haven't heard you since last week. So, yeah. Right. What's new since then? <laughs> you know? Sure. Well, and I got married. (laughs) With teen vampires, it's more beyond, you know, just the erotic. Um, They also have other emotions, and it's not just anger. It's sadness and love. And I I know the first time that Matthew, I think it was Matthew, cried and um, blood came out. I was shocked, shocked. Um, But it's nice that they have that emotional depth as well. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap right here, I think. Yeah. Any last words for... uh... Oh. The listeners, Gene. They're my favorite vampires, and I've pretty much read them all. They're the perfect balance of humanity and history and family, and I just love them. Yeah. Angela? (laughs) Same thing. I've always been intrigued by vampires, just the mysticism and their longevity um, and their accumulation of wealth and knowledge, and that's really what interests me the most when people say, what are you, which... Uh, demon or vampire. Of course, I'm a demon, but I would love to be a vampire for that accumulation of um, knowledge. It's just fascinating to me. I think that kind of time in me would be a lot of trouble. If I had that kind of time, (laughs) I can't imagine what the heck I I would do in those worlds. I think if I were in Philippe's family, he'd have to put me in hiding because I would (laughs) have done some stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, uh, it wouldn't be pretty. It's not a good thing. I think I'm good as a demon, but It's a yes. good thing they told Philippe not to make any more daughters. Yeah. <laughs> I would have gotten myself in all kinds of problems. But I I do agree with you guys. Vampires are so fascinating, and I think this is one of the reasons why I'm a fantasy fiction fan for life. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a fan of all vampires, but I, I do love a good story. And if it happens to include a vampire, uh, make it so I can relate to him. Make it so I can see see what's in his soul and maybe see what he's seen. And with Matthew, eventually we did get there with him. And and I really appreciate that. And that's another key. Dub's vampires have souls. Yes. Yes. I mean, we've got a Catholic vampire here who still goes to church. I love that. I know. So do I. All right. So thank you for listening to our rambling. Hopefully you found some of it informative and entertaining. (laughs) Mostly entertaining. Mostly entertaining and this, and I'm going to leave this in here for the listeners. This is going to be fun to edit because we've had some phone calls and all kinds of things, but <laughs> we're going to muddle through this. Kids, yeah. spouses, we're waiting for the dogs to bark right now. So we're going to try right. to wrap this up. At one point, I, uh, I speculated that you were beating eggs and talking at the phone <laughs> on the phone for a while <laughs> because something you were doing, it sounded like you were beating eggs. So I pictured you with a bowl in your arm. No, talking on the phone. I did not make cookie dough. <laughs> I was like, wow, she's doing a lot over there. All right, audience, I'm going to say goodbye to you right now. Um, make sure you visit us on demonsdomain.com. For this specific podcast, visit us on demonsdiscuss.com, and it'll take you right to the page. FYI, it's all the same site. But if you want just the podcast, just go to demonsdiscuss.com. And it's all right there for you. Um, if you have any comments or questions, demonsdiscuss at gmail.com. Just send it on over. That's us on the other end. We'll read it. I promise. And let us know if we can read your name on the podcast. Let us know if it's okay. Because I won't if you, you say no. And that's all I have for you. So thanks for letting us be in your head. Uh-huh. And bye-bye.
Thank mm-hmm. you.